welcome to The Big Interview. I'm Graham Hunter. Welcome to the show. I went back to Derby County's training ground recently to speak to Shea Given. He's part of Frank Lampard's coaching staff, along with Jody Morris. And you can all see for yourselves that things are going well. A talented trio, a talented team. I first met Shea uh, behind the scenes at Michael Carrick's testimonial at Old Trafford, liked him. And the fact that he was a top-class goalkeeper for so many years, for several different clubs, and also played elite international football for Ireland, allied to the fact that he's got an interesting life, is a characterful, funny, articulate man, meant big interview guest. It's a pleasure to be with our guest at the moment. It's a pleasure to be back at your club um, because you've got one of the most uh, sparkling, well-laid-out training grounds in England. We're at Derby County with Shay Given. Shay, thank you for joining us. No problem. Looking forward to this. Um, because you're a busy and talented man, you probably haven't had the time to listen to our series. But let me assure you, it's true that in a Chris Wardle interview up in his fantastic loft in his house in Sheffield, uh, bust of Stan and Ollie, which was less fashionable than it is now with the movie coming out and its music everywhere. We inevitably had to ask Chris about Gaza. Mm -hmm. Now, Chris told us that one of his favourite anecdotes was the egg sniper. When Gaza, sharing a hotel room with Chris on tour somewhere, went out and bought lots of eggs and had saw that his window opened out down to on the street where where these cash points were and as people came up to draw their hard-earned money out Gaza would pick them off with with eggs the beautiful aim now let let me put you Shay in a sort of Bruce Willis um what's that film you look like Bruce Willis actually (laughs) is that why Bruce is involved this you can't you can't (laughs) see this but this is the sound of a handshake (laughs) thank you for that I'll take that every day of the week what's his what's his great film uh, Die Hard yeah so if you found yourself in a Die Hard situation right I think you've got Gaza-esque powers could you bring so Nakatomi terrorist tower terrorist down with spuds (laughs) could you pummel those terrorists with spuds and, and have you a past that trained you for such a task? Because <laughs> I believe you did. I did have a past of, of throwing spuds at, at passers-by. And, and no, I mean, I grew up in a, in a family with, we had a market gardening business and, and we actually we actually grew all the stuff we sold. And one of them was spuds, of course. And at the end of a hard day of gathering spuds, eight hours bent over and filling spud baskets was, was the tractor journey home with a trailer full of spuds. And, and anybody, any pedestrians on on our on our path got clotted with the the smaller, not so uh, large potatoes, should we say? And uh, we're diving in the hedge for cover. Did you pick? Did you so? Like, I mean, let, let's not blow our, our sort of tatty throwing <laughs> uh, talents out of proportion. Could you pick? At what distance could you pick off a passerby with a spud? Well, one of the one of our friends, Alan, he's just a work guy for us. He used to drive the tractor. He used to have like a he used to point with his left finger, and literally it was like a. A sniper thing on the top of the gun, and literally you'd be sort of running. This is like between breaks, trying to get away from him, and literally, <laughs> as if he used that, and he just would, would clock you in the back La- of the head. Laser guided spuds. It was, it was, and you couldn't get away from him. You're trying to zigzag away from him, but he had a an unbelievable throw. But yeah, you can imagine we get some obscenities sort of thrown back in our direction after after he. You could have made yourself past. slightly unpopular. I'd have slightly, to slightly, but you know, it's normally a laugh because. It's a local small community, so you knew every person you're, you're chucking the spuds at, like so they'd be they'd be giving you a bit of banter back. But I mean, it was hard days of work to be honest, Graham. It was lot, lots of hours in the fields, and and not the glamour of you say Derby County sitting here talking to you today. I mean, it was it was a tough upbringing we had, yeah. You, 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 you're talking about something that I think the majority of people who are listening now haven't done. Yeah. But you're talking to somebody who was the king of the spuds, man. <laughs> uh, to earn a buck, we went up to, you've maybe, I don't know if you've seen Mackey's Ice Cream, or Mackey's Ice Cream exists. Uh-huh. It's up there with Ben and Jerry's. And right. Maitland Mackey had a farm, he was my dad's best friend, his best man. And um, so we were sent to tatty picking. And uh, for anyone who doesn't know it, tatty picking is brutal, eh? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the moralising thing is, is, is my brother, one of my brothers, I had four brothers, and one of my brothers used to always have the honour of driving the tractor. And we used to always say, obviously, you're my dad's dad's like golden child, basically, and we we're all just the sort of the workmen in the field. But literally, the demoralising thing is, you'd you'd have ten yards marked out. This is your ten yards. You gather the ten yards. 
you get the basket of the way and the next thing my brother's started raving the tractor up behind you to just spin another drill out and it's just the 10 yards you've just never ending is just covered like and that's for eight hours a day like so um have you done worse work in your life than that well i've i've, I've we used to have, like thin turnips vegetables and, and probably one of the worst things one day i had to go and pick carrots in the field and you mentioned how cold it was one day I had to pick carrots out and they were frozen in the ground probably similar to the weather here today yeah, yeah. and you had to spin them to get them out and my hands were that cold no gloves on it's just it was, I was only like 10 or 11 and, and, and my hands were like cold, I started heating them up on the exhaust pipe, the big long exhaust pipe of the tractor and you know when the blood starts coming back, I was actually crying in the field because it was that cold. It's like, you know, when, you, yeah. when, it, when the blood comes back. And I was like, I'll toughen up, you know, one of them ones, I was get on with it, like so. Without, without just going for the laughs, the reason I introduced this, because there, there's no point in cheating, um, mm. listeners. I, I wasn't in Lifford, I wasn't hit by one of them spots. <laughs> I've read Any Given Saturday, which... I thoroughly recommend to you, not just because it's Shay's book, but because yeah. it's damn good. You know, it's honest and funny, and the stories do. Some of the things we try to do here, which is lift the personalities out of football and yeah. show you f not in the one-dimensional way that some of the yeah. media choose to. So any given Saturday, go find it, go buy it, go read mm -hmm. it. I, I would contend, from what I've learned in the game, that you don't survive at the elite level you did in an Ashland club wise for so long simply on talent. Therefore, tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm going back to growing up because, you know, the, the, the toughening up uh, is a theme that comes up in our podcast a lot when we talk to footballers about how they were treated as junior footballers. Mm. You know, your love for your dad and your respect for your dad and what a character he is shines out of the book. But equally, in another anecdote that makes me laugh, but also makes me shiver, when, I don't know if it was Kieran smashes the hi-fi. Mm. Yes, Whoever Kieran. it was, sorry, right, Kieran. No, no, you're right, Kieran. yeah. Kieran, you're right now, sorry. Good research, Graham. Yeah, well, Kieran, <laughs> I phoned him just. He's still not owned up, actually, in his sweater. He, what was about? He, he dodged all my calls. Well, I, I said, Kieran, I'm just doing my fact checking here. <laughs> so the hi fi comes in the house and gets broken, right? I mean, that's the basis of the story. I don't know yeah, what right, happens yeah. to it. It came at Christmas, obviously, Santa Claus brought it, and there was a glass door, you know, the old sort of stacking systems with the CD, the radio, the tape cassette thing, and there was a glass front to it. It's only a couple of things, Boxing Day the day after, and someone smashed the glass, the, the glass thing to keep the dust off and all that. Well, you can imagine my dad's reaction. He's obviously worked really hard to get the stereo for the whole family and brought us all in, sh sort of shouting and screaming at us. And <laughs> no one would own up. It was literally no one. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was one of them moments. It was like that song, Shaggy. It wasn't me. Who broke the stereo? It wasn't me. Anyway, so it got to the point that no one was on up. He goes, right, that's it. Everyone out to the garage. And like the weather was to Boxing Day or Freezing the 27th. Cold. So you can imagine. And we mean the garage. It was an open garage. It wasn't a garage with a door. It was bitter. Like someone's had pajamas on. I think Marcus was holding one of the, the babies, actually, who wasn't sent to the garage, obviously, because it wasn't the baby that broke it. And he's like, you can put that baby down as well, because he was trying to rock the baby <laughs> to, to get away from yeah, it. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. On the baby, and he's looking after, put that baby down, you're out as well. So we're all standing in the garage for, it seemed an eternity, probably only 20 minutes, but it was like, right, who's done it? And, and still no one owns up. Nobody broke. And we've still got a WhatsApp group chat. And even now, obviously this time of year, Christmas is not long gone. It's like, right, Kieran, maybe this is the year you want to own up to it. And, and he's like, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it wasn't me <laughs> again. So the, the concept of omerta, silence or death, <laughs> didn't it originate in Sicily, it originated in Lifford, did it? <laughs> the, the reason I'm asking about that, because... I think it tells beautiful stories about a past that's now um, long ago for you and for me, but surviving in football is hard. Football's a hard game. Mm. I think that, you know, for those who can't lift the lid and they maybe only see the games or the interviews in the flash, they don't know about the, the travelling, the tiredness, occasionally in everybody's life, maybe the bullying or the unfairness or mm. a, an injury that's brutally badly timed. So to, to be this good this long... Things, experiences like that and a multitude of others must have been a root cause of why you've succeeded or is that, am I well, drawing too much yeah, about your no, foundation and your core? No, I think most people would, would, would say that most people who have been at the top of, of their sport, whatever that may be, then they've, they've had, you know, tough times in their life. I think not just growing up or whatever, but, you know, maybe relationships or like my upbringing was very tough. I lost my mum when I was four to cancer. You know, that was very, very tough. And that, I used that as a strength throughout my career. And also, you know, we mentioned, we, have a, we can have a laugh about it now, but you know, Gallon Spuds, and we actually, at the weekends on a Friday after school, we would go and sell them and all day Saturday, knocking on everyone's door around Lifford, yeah. fruit and vegetables, knock my door and you'd be going to sleep at night and you'd be hearing fruit and vegetables in your head. Cause that's every door you would do that to like, and, and I realized how hard a long day's work is. And then 
they have the the privilege of playing football and obviously now I'm a coach with Derby County but to be still involved in football I feel that you know especially when I was playing it was like you know I need to pinch myself at times because to go from my hands and knees for eight hours a day and not get paid it wasn't it wasn't paid work we're on we had to do it for to put for the food on the table for our family now to, to play football and and dive about you know training great training grounds and, and playing amazing stadiums around the world not just in the Premier League but around the world and you know I'm, I've been very very lucky so I'll be, I feel very privileged to have played football. Did it, did it at any stage change your relationship with... Because what I meant was, it, it read to me as if you learned core values, good values. Mm. Tough, yeah, but I wasn't saying, oh, you know, poor you, like how tough it was. But it it's, gives you steel and it gives you judgment and it gives you principles, mm. I think. And not every kid's got the benefit of those. We, we see that in football. Yeah, it's actually yeah. quite difficult to replicate that if yeah. kids have come into football without that. Yeah, it's difficult because I've got my own kids now, obviously, and, and it's difficult to get that balance, like, because, mm. you know, to get my son to wash my car now would be a bit of a chore in a sense, you know, it'd be not a chore, but he'd want money for it. Or, he might, he might take a bit of pocket money or something yeah, or yeah. whatever, and it's like, that's probably the same with young players now because they've, they've sort of, as you, you say, you're at Derby County now, the amazing facilities we have here, the, the, the underage teams have got, you know, five or six pitches up there, we've got an indoor pitch there, we've got the best gym, we've got the best of everything, and... and you know, it's difficult to to sort of get the values across. Maybe what a hard day's work is, but forgetting that a hard day's work, but forget how hard it is to get to the top of their profession. You know, they come in with all the new kit and then everything, new balls. I don't know, just everything sort of laid on for them in a good way. But then sometimes they might lose out. The other side of the coin is, do they really feel? You know, once they sign that contract, do, do they sort of sit back and think, you know, now I've, I've made it? But it should be the opposite. It should be now. This is where the work starts. This is where I really have to sit down and. and and speak to coaches and, and, and whatever, don't know, fitness people, nutritionists, sports science, strength and conditioning, mm -hmm. and really try and be the best that I can be because, you know, life's short and, and, and the football career is, is even shorter. You know, the, the career, the, the span of a player, especially an outfield player, goalkeepers like myself probably can go a bit longer, but it's quite a short career and, mm -hmm. and they have to make the most of it. It feels to me as if, like, you know, you can't take a devilishly brilliant 25-yard free kick in the top corner unless you practice that. <laughs> 200 times you can't struggle with the problems that life and football bring to you if you've never struggled yeah That's yeah yeah the yeah, practice true. of struggling is really important yeah and i don't mean like <clears throat> struggling like push down but like i will beat this obstacle i'll beat this life experience if things are hard i'll learn from it and i'll yeah. better myself yeah yeah i think i think with my life as i say my upbringing and obviously the work and and, and i say lose my mum. That, that's the life that I had growing up, so I don't really know anything different. But it was a tough life, it wasn't It wasn't an easy life, and I feel that it's, it has stood me in good stead. At that time, as a kid, I was like, I wish I was like made up the road who, who you know, was on his computer or he's playing whatever, or he's got his feet up watching TV, but that wasn't the case. We, we didn't have any choice, but I do realise now, looking back, that that was one of the, you know, the core values, as you say, that I took to the next level in, in playing football, and, and every day pushing myself to try and be the best every single day. Mm -hmm. Well, to what extent did, did, did you ever look at the, the fans at a stage in your club where either fame or wealth or maybe other colleagues can, can draw you away from the fans, but that concept of knowing what hard day's work is and what 45 quid to come and watch a game is, mm. did, did that stay in your mind or did, you know was there a relationship between you having to do the fruit and veg and yeah. whatever as a youngster and knowing what the you know, the people you're trying to entertain and play for. Mm. That relationship's the stronger. I, I don't think that's ever changed for me personally. And I know a lot of players will have changed once they've got into a first team and once they've done well. And, they, you know, they feel they're above, you know, the, the normal person on the street. And I've never felt that. You know, I still go to, to the supermarket now and get, the, the you know, the shopping and for the nappies and baby wipes and food and, and whatever has to be taken in for the house. I don't feel that, that someone else should be doing that. That's, that's sort of my job as a father and I don't feel that I'm above and even when I was playing football I was the same I still went to the supermarket and, and got the groceries or whatever so I, I, that probably comes a little bit green from your, my upbringing my dad would be you know he would always have the door open for people the door was never even locked to be honest you know everyone was always welcome in our house as well and, and maybe that's an Irish thing that you know everyone's quite quite relaxed and everyone would, would mm -hmm. you know especially where I'm from if you you know you know people in England wouldn't wave and stuff or say hello walking by if you walk by they wouldn't even say hello to you in the street whereas if in Lifford or in Donegal, for that matter, you didn't say hello, they'd be like, what's wrong with him? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, it is, is, you know, whereas if you went to London, probably, you know, the people wouldn't, would run over you nearly, not run over you, but they, would, they wouldn't say hello, do you know what I mean? Well, there's it's a not... great mass report sketch about the reports of a northerner on the loose saying hello to people. Yeah, no. And there's a police advisor, but if somebody approaches you and says hello, <laughs> he's got, you know, take a distance. <laughs> that is right. right, isn't it? But like, I've never lost that concept of people 
you know, working hard and, and, and you know, a, a good fraction of their money is going to go on a, on a match ticket or traveling to an away game or, you know, a few beers or food at the game, whatever they, they you know, a lot of fans, that that's their life, that their football club is their life and people maybe ask for autographs or pictures and I would never, you know, turn that away or turn that down. I would be like, oh yeah, that's the least I can do, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, take me from take me away from Lifford to a, a term that I'm going to use as if I know it, but I've just learned it today. Uh-huh. Take me to the Velvet Strand, and I don't mean that in a bad way. <laughs> take me to Port Marnock. Mm. Now, I'm presuming that back in 2003, there weren't spuds to hand. When is there an armed robbery taking place when you're in a yeah. in a hotel in Port Marnock? Yeah. Can you talk me through that? <laughs> the random in it. Yeah. It's funny because it's kind of like a split level. So there's the, the reception was we're in a restaurant, like say we're sitting in here now, and above us was the reception, and there were stairs just just you know, when people are listening, so they can't really hear. So the stairs up the reception were about I don't know twenty yards away from where we were sitting, and there were just just uh, the whole team was there. The, the, you know the staff. Who's we? The, the, who are the, we, the Republic we? of Ireland full international squad was there and management, and it was like we just heard like shouting and. and and sort of like quite loud and we just thought oh it must be someone just having a row about something or whatever we didn't know and the next thing we heard a gun go off like literally a shotgun going off and we're like, ah, like obviously there's a few sweat. what the hell's that people get on the tables people ran out there was an exit sort of door to the other side of the room to go back down into the main part of the hotel to get away from it and stuff and it was just so weird because we didn't know if the guy with the gun was going to just show he's come down the step literally had a flight of steps to come down and the full international team was there so it was, it was a bit scary, to be honest, and, and luckily he just, well, not luckily, I think he just maybe we took some money from the takings and reception and, and shot off. It was off. a full-on robbery. It was a full robbery, yeah. For anybody who hasn't been near a shotgun, like, mm. it's quite loud, eh? Yes, yeah, loud, yeah. You, you heard it, right? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, there was no, there's only, like, a, a level between us, and it was open, sort of, so it was just, we heard it all right, so literally we, we, we were diving a cover a little bit because we realised then that this is not just somebody having an argument this up, isn't up a drill. reception. No, it's not a fire drill for sure. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a bit scary. And then after, you know, when, when it all calmed down, obviously the Gardaí Shea Connor, which is the, for people who don't know, the equivalent of the police in Ireland, came out and and you know that you could see all the pellet guns in the roof. So we shot the gun into the roof of the reception. You could see all the people. holes in the. Yeah, yeah. They frightened people. Yeah. So definitely done that. Definitely done the trick. Who had the quickest heels? There was a few gone, and then a few people started taking their watches off. What if he wants her? Why? We, you know, there's just some mad stuff goes on in your head. It's funny how your mind works. Yeah, isn't thinking it? maybe he's here. He's, for us, where where's the team at? Because we're we're just eating at that time. Maybe he knows. You know, you think he's done his homework. He couldn't get talking about Bruce Wallace. Wallace. You know, he's done all yeah, these yeah, different yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's come to get us. <laughs> so people started taking their watches. People started running. It was just weird, but um, luckily enough, he wasn't there for us. Thankfully. Now, we've had the great good fortune of um, picking off quite a few of that team. Mm. Robbie Keane's been on this podcast. Yeah. Duffer's been on this podcast, very entertainingly. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kev Kilban has been on it as well. Um, which of those that I've just named was nearly lost to the sea at Port Manor? <laughs> Did Duffer tell you that story? Well, I, no, there's, still, there's still many people who fear that he wandered off. You know how like, the, Be- the I mean, Beatles fans say when Cartney actually did die in a car crash, yeah. right? And it's just, it's been imposter for the last 35 years. Yeah. There are some people who wonder if it's the real Duffer. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what I'm saying? Oh, that's brilliant. We used, to, we used to do that a lot, actually, because we, we stayed in Port Marnock, and for anyone who doesn't know Port Marnock, it's right on the beach of the hotel. It's beautiful, isn't so it? It's beautiful, yeah, it's beautiful, but you can imagine the sea is, is, is not so warm. It's not like... I'd say cold. It's not next to Barcelona where it's nice and warm, <laughs> but it's really cold, to say the least. But what we used, you know, we were, this is before ice baths and stuff, our ice bath was the sea. So a lot of the times after training, the lads would go in, and Duffer was, was probably one of the best professionals I've ever worked with, to be honest, and he would religiously go in after training every day, you know, for that recovery to get ready either for the game the next day or for another training session. But he would go in with the headphones on, he would go in with a coat on and, and you know, shorts or whatever. And, and um, I think some woman was walking her dog along the beach at the time or something. And, and she shouted like Duffer and Duffer had music on or something. He's turned around, he's given, ah, don't be silly. I don't know, he didn't even want to listen to her. He just kind of, was kind of like, he was in his own zone. And you can imagine how cold, because I've been in there myself, how cold it is. The last thing you want to do is have, have any conversation with anyone you're just trying to get in there and, and get it and done, get it get done out. and get out. So she's obviously took it. Oh, he's he's gone to like obviously take his own life. He's gonna end it up. Yeah, he's gone because he's got looks. For, she, she can only see. You can't see. He's got shorts. So she can only see up to his waist. Like and he's got his full clothes on, and he's just walking into deeper and deeper into the sea. So she's ran off and call, called the local coast guard. And next thing, so Duffer's always been. I think we normally done about five, maybe five, ten minutes max in the sea and back up to the hotel, showered and that. 
And by the time the bleeding Coast Guard came and the helicopter, there's nobody there. He's nobody there. So that makes it even. He's busting. You think he's gone? Yeah. So up and down the thing we, for it seemed must be a good couple of hours looking for him and 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 then realise obviously I don't know how long it took him to realise it was actually Duffer who's tucked up on his bed at this time after a nice warm lunch and he's probably watching a film or something in his bed getting ready for training. Red the cells pulsing through the muscles, I know, yeah. ready to rip a defender. We, we might even looking out the window again. I wonder what that helicopter's doing up and down the coast there, because it's just outside our hotel. I feel just for the record, though, it's a beautiful anecdote. We need to say if Henry doesn't know him, he's worth looking for. Who, Duffer? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Let's make that. He's one of our best players, like, so... I don't know if the woman realised it was Duffer or, or, or she couldn't tell, but... Ah, so if it had been somebody else in the squad, she no, might have just me. let him go. If it was me, she would have just, she would have just uh, let me go, yeah. I wasn't fishing for that one, but I hear you. She wouldn't waste the petrol on the it's helicopter. It's the same with us, too. If it was him, <laughs> they'd go in the street. Wouldn't even have like, made the phone call. Thank <laughs> fuck he's <laughs> out there. <laughs> what took you so long? <laughs> yeah. He, he, which gives rise to, uh, not more serious, but a slightly more difficult question in that um, I don't want to be hypocritical. I live life quite fully, mm -hmm. energetically. I feel that the night and day are equal in terms of their importance. Yeah. So I like to go out. Mm. But when you spend the serious part of your profession interviewing footballers, managers, sometimes travelling with them, and in later life in Spain where the doors are more open than the Premier League was, seeing them off the record and doing the things that used to happen in this country between journalists and footballers because it's a little bit more relaxed in Spain, you, you grow up, particularly as, a, as somebody who was born in Scotland, you grow up with this strange idea about what drinks for. And you see, I certainly grew up in an era where, for example, and he's been in this series too, Walter Smith definitely had a Wednesday policy of the team that drinks together, stays together, wins yeah. together. Now, it's not as simple as times have changed in terms of our sports science, what we put in, what yeah. footballers put. Yeah. But given that that has changed so much, and given that I think you've always believed that there's a, a natural boost, a natural boon to a group of elite footballers playing together and having fun together, and then taking some of that onto the training ground and the pitch, how do you maintain the idea, the central idea of that, without it including alcohol in the modern game. What's mm. the, what's the, or some, it, listen, yeah. every football, every rugby player, golf, it doesn't matter, they can drink. Mm. But to the extent that we know was the case, yeah, yeah. and that you had fun doing in your career, mm -hmm. and that I do in my life, how do you suck out the juice of the benefit and not have the physical bodies of the footballers yeah. suffer? It's difficult, I think, in the modern game, because as you say, I think, especially in the Premier League, different countries might be different. But the intensity of the game, and even in the championship, the level we're at at the minute, the, the intensity and, and, and the amount of games, like if you look at our fixture list for the next six weeks, you will see every three days near enough we've got a game. So Relentless. Relentless. So, so we're not just talking about performance, we're talking about recovery too. Yeah, that's the big thing, is recovery, especially especially when the games co some, come so thick and fast. But the other side of corners, I, I, I would say, and I have said in my book, that, which you've probably read, is... I think there is a time and a place for the group of the players to get together, mm -hmm. have a few beers, unwind, have a have a bite of food, get together, have a bit of crack, you know, and 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 then talk about it and and, and get to know each other. As a sort of looking from the start of my career, for example, for Ireland was when I was nineteen, and that's a long time ago now. Mm -hmm. But like we would, it would be you weren't allowed to stay, and it wasn't like it was the whole squad. The twenty three men were, were was no one was like, well, I'm not going out. I can, and then. When I finished my career, which isn't that long ago, in Ireland, it was like, and this is just the way the whole thing started. No, no one was going out. It was just you were all in the hotel. And the thing I got got of that from a probably because I'm a coach now was there'd be some players in that squad that I never really got to know because yeah. I would just see them on the training pitch. So we go on the training pitch, the bus to the from the hotel, the training pitch, see them on the training pitch. We'd train and then get back in the bus. Yeah, have a bit of lunch. They go back up to the rooms and then see them again the next day of training. Yeah. You know. Whereas previous squads or, you know, maybe generations before would be, yeah, we'd train and then we'd have a few beers, we'd get together, we'd have the crack, we'd be playing cards, we'd be, you know, there'd be no real computers going on or like now they're all, I don't know, FIFA and PlayStation and I don't, I'm never into this kind of stuff. But, you know, instead of having a few beers at the right time, don't get me wrong, I think there's, you, you need to have it at the right time, but yeah. instead of having, having a few beers, now they're all in a room playing Fortnite or, or all got their headphones on playing FIFA and all this kind of stuff and I'm like, then I felt maybe it's time to retire, but it was kind of like, it, it's a shame in one way, but I understand that that's the way the game's gone a little bit, but I still believe and I still think there is, for example, if you didn't play till a Saturday and you met up on the previous Saturday, I still think the Saturday or the Sunday of the previous week would be still a time, I believe, 
you could still get the lads together and and let them let their hair down a little bit to, to get that togetherness. So I think people who who are fans of the game but maybe don't get inside the game forget that some players can be shy mm. and might not come out of their yeah, room yeah. for reasons other than just playing on a computer yeah, or whatever. And I remember Gary Neville talking about in Euro '96. I think Terry Venable's assistant was Ted Buxton, and Gary certainly said that one of the assistants knocked on doors and said, "You must come down." Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's some food. And there's a couple of glasses of wine, mm -hmm. but um, you have to bond because some of you players don't know this no. guy, and some of you are new and whatever. And Terry and, and Tip Buxton at that stage felt that that um, bonding and getting to just simply getting to know each yeah. other, yeah. and getting rid of some of the barriers was an important thing. That was from a squad of all English, all speaking the same language. Modern football clubs, I don't know about how many different languages or cultures mm -hmm. you have at Derby, yeah. but as you go up the ladder towards the Premier League, mm. you can have a dressing room full of 15 different nationalities and yeah. languages, yeah. and finding a way to not just break down barriers, but unify them away yeah. from training and playing yeah. is hard. Yeah, it's difficult when you say Premier League players, well, there's so many nationalities. We, we're lucky we've only got a few, you think it is. We've not got loads of different nationalities, and they all luckily speak English, so we're, we're lucky in that front, but I believe you go into all their change rooms and there's a Spanish corner over there, there's a lot yeah. of French lads there and, and you can kind of understand why they do it because that's their, their natural tongue, that's their fluent language and, and, and it's difficult probably to get them all interacting but you know I still believe, I mean you, you, you live in Spain so I mean I know a few players who go to Spain the night before a game there'd be a bottle of wine on the table yep. or maybe even sometimes pre-match and they'd be encouraged to have a glass of wine yeah. you know before a game like Pepe Reina has three or four beers religiously the night before a game because that's yep. his routine, that's what he wants to do and and if you said that in England, they'd be thinking, oh, that, that's scandalous, you can't be doing that. But, you know, I think there's, there's a balance. But a lot of the Mediterraneans, and I'm speaking about myself here, not anybody else, mm. have the word stop yeah. in their vocabulary. Yeah. Now, many Celts, uh, yeah, can't yeah. speak for the English, don't. Yeah. One means three, three means ten. Yeah. And there were a lot of footballers, certainly when I was growing up, who could do that. Yeah. And therefore, the idea of a couple of beers, like, for example, Fernando Ayero and Ivan Campbell, when they moved to Bolton, We'll go out to Harper's in Manchester for a beer the day before the game. Yeah. They both did that for a couple of beers and a chat with the owners and their yeah, friends yeah. and whatever, knowing that if they did that in Spain, they'd have been castigated. Mm. You know, they'd been held up to ridicule, not drinking wine with a meal, but going out to a pub the day before a game, yeah, it just yeah. would have been not the done thing. And in England, they found the balance that you're talking about. Yeah. We can do that, and it's actually quite good for us, and it relaxes us. And mm. So the middle path and balance is obviously yeah. important. I, I accept that. Um, not on the same subject exactly, but we have... Beautiful sponsors, Bet365 have sent this question in for you. Mm -hmm. And it's, an, it's, I guess it's an easy one, a really easy one. What's the toughest or worst part of being a goalkeeper? The toughest or worst part? It's probably the loneliness of it, of when you make a mistake, the loneliness of, us of just you there on your own and, 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 and thinking, you know, I should have saved that or whatever. You've let your team down. We talked about the fans before. You feel like you've, well, this is me personally, you feel like you've yeah. let the fans down, the club down, the owners. You you feel that you're responsible, you know, to 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 what's just happened, you know. And, and the thing is, early part of my career, I struggled with with dealing with mistakes, and 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 I took it on board myself to get a sports psychologist to, to help me with that. But you know, it, it is a lonely position, and then you might not touch the ball for another twenty minutes after that because that's just the position you're in. Whereas if you, I don't know, you, it always gets me as the commentators, for example, would say, you know, striker's gone through and he's missed a chance or a cross come in and he's toe poked it wide and. The, the, the natural reply from a commentator, most commentators, oh, he was unlucky there, he'll get the next one. Yeah. Whereas if you flip it to the other side, a goalkeeper is like, if it goes through your hands or through your legs, whatever, it's like, what, what the hell is he doing there? I mean, how has he not stopped that? My granny would have saved that. You know, it's just, there's no, it's black or white with the keeper, it's you save it. Yeah, you're probably expected, a lot of the commentators, well, you're expected to save it, and if you don't, it's like, you know, what the hell is he doing? Whereas the other side of the pitch is like, he's expected to score, or he's, he'll get the next one, he was unlucky. You know, it's just a different, Vocabulary, yeah. David yeah. Priest has been in this series, and David didn't sort of play at your level, but analytically, he yeah. talks really well and yeah. educates all of us mm. about the art of goalkeeping. And that idea about vocabulary, I don't know why or why do you think it is mm. that through time immemorial, the goalkeeper has, when there's a problem situation or an error, yeah. is kind of portrayed as a victim or somebody to be beaten, whereas yeah, yeah. the striker is let off and there'll be. They'll be golder in the corner. They'll yeah. be jammed tomorrow for yeah, the striker. Yeah. What, yeah, why yeah. is that idea built up and that vocabulary? Built I don't know up? if it's a mentality that is, is even go back to your school days. People would say, "Oh, we pick the team," and then the last two standing, or oh, you two going goals. I don't know if there's a there's a I don't know a mentality that you know the keepers maybe the the less talented than the rest of them. But 
I used to be the top goal scorer in my school. I, I, I used to love playing up front. You know, I was I was kind of cross between playing out the fielder and goals. My dad said it should be a goalkeeper. He was a goalkeeper and all that kind of stuff. But you know, I think you know people maybe even later in life even think still think that maybe we're not as talented as, as the outfield players. But you look at Ederson now. You look at Kepa at Chelsea. You look at the amount of money he's played. That much would David de Gea be worth now? You know, Allison's gone for sixty-seven million to Liverpool. You look at the prices that are getting paid for. There's suddenly, in my opinion, there's been a, a, literally a wake-up call to all managers, all owners, and all people around the world that, do you know what? Yes, the striker might be the most important, but I'll tell you what, the second most important was the goalkeeper. Because if you've got someone keeping them out, and especially now when you look at the styles of play, that, for example, Man City with, with Ederson, how Pep Guardiola wants to set his team up, and you know, one of his most important players and his whole team, and, and you know, you talk about Aguero and all these flair players and Sterling and all these guys, but... One of the main people in all this, his whole system is the goalkeeper. And, and that is critical. And, and what, what they paid for him now, you could say, is a bargain. They paid £35 million for him because he's been so good and, and so good with the ball at his feet as well. He literally is a, an 11th outfield player when they have the ball. And it's, it's, it's just remarkable, I feel, that it's taken so long for, for, for people to realise that. Well, I, turning that around, I'm so glad you've... T- I, went, I went in a bit of a rant there, didn't I? No, 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 <laughs> because that was, that's the central part of what we wanted to talk to you about, because mm. whether it... Look, look, before we talk about breaking keepers down, whether you talk about De Gea or Alisson or Ederson, the British media predominantly say that the top three goalkeepers in the world are here. I think Neuer was, I think because of age and injury, that time's probably gone. I know that a lot of people here don't watch La Liga quite as much as they used to when it was on Sky, Mm -hmm. um, or as much as I do, because I live there. But if I look at Courtois, who's just come back, Kehler, who won three straight Champions League, Marc-Andre Ter Stegen, who's a different kind of goalkeeper in that he's probably dimensioned like you, whereas, you know, Ederson, Courtois are, are... Giants of men. Well, Ederson's not. I wouldn't disagree with Ederson's not, but Courtois for sure, yeah. Courtois, is Neuer, for sure. yeah, for sure. Neuer was, and also I'd go so and De Gea's height is gigantic. Yeah. But like uh, Mark has terrific feet. He's a sweeper, mm-hmm. not just a sweeper keeper. He is, he is a sweeper. And if you keep going down the leagues and you look at um, David Soria or, or Neto at Valencia, and you add just those two countries without even going back to where Leno came from, and I, I, I've yet to learn enough about Leno, but. You know, it'd be my contention that we're, we're living in the golden age of goalkeeping mm. for any number of reasons, the number of candidates you can argue about, about how to compose a top five around Europe, I don't mind the world. Mm. It's brutally hard. You can say, well, my team wants to play at this, therefore he's better than him because of our brand of football. Fine, okay. Mm. One, who are the guys that, are your, that have your preference for whatever reason you want to say? And two, why is it that we've come to this golden? What has the level of goalkeepers across a broad spectrum gone up? I think the position has changed over the years, and especially in recent years. And, and maybe that's why maybe the goalkeepers are more in the in the spotlight to a certain degree because the transfer fees for one, you know, 60, 70 million for a goalkeeper. Now, you, you, <laughs> when when would it, I don't know? Even I know the the. The transfer fee's gone mad probably in the last four or five years, but even, even, I don't know, ten years ago, if you spent six or seven million pound on a goalkeeper, you'd be like, oh god, that's a crazy amount of money to spend on a goalkeeper. Like, are you sure we we don't need an or striker? Do you know what I mean? We'll get someone in a free or something in goals. But I think, as I said, I've already said, but there's there's a realization that this is a hugely important position for for the whole team and and the way we want to play. I mean, I'll go back to Man City, the way they want to play. You know, Liverpool, Klopp as well. You could argue. I mean, I'm talking about. Premier League clubs because, as you said, I don't see. I mean, I know there's all black as well at Atletico. You, you didn't mention who's a, a phenomenal goalkeeper. He, he might be my number one, right? Yeah, now. yeah. In in what I would consider pure goalkeeping, the art of stopping goals. Yeah. When it comes to playing with the feet, then it's a broader discussion. I would yeah, need yeah. your input. But all black. But that, that's a, a case to be number one. Yeah, everyone everyone has a different thing. So Pep Guardiola might think. The number one box you need to take is how good is he with the ball at his feet, right? Okay, Ederson is, is probably for me the, the best maybe in the world. His composure with the ball at his feet, his thing way. Then you go, who's the best shot stopper? Now you would say maybe David De Gea or you, you mentioned All Black, they could be two of the best shot stoppers. But Pep Guardiola might be sitting in this chair and thinking, 
yeah, they're, they're fantastic shot stoppers, mm -hmm. but I want them to be better with the ball at defeat. I want mm -hmm. them to be the 11 player when we have the ball. Mm -hmm. You know, Ederson last week was playing in midfield. He had a 1 2 with Fernandinho in midfield last week, which was funny, but, but actually sums up how comfortable he is with the ball at his feet. And I think even, I'm not sure which Man City player this year was quoted as saying the best passer of the ball at the football club is Ederson, which is, you think of the talent they have at Man City. So it's very difficult, I think, for any individual, even a goalkeeping expert, and I'm certainly not one of them, to sit in any room, they say who's the best goalkeeper in the world, because I think it's, it's who's the manager, what manager at that club, and what, do you know what I mean? How What's like play. Simeone at yeah. Atletico would be like, well, I wouldn't change all black way any keeper in the world. There's no way he'd you know ever I mean? allow Ederson to do that. He'd never sign him. That's, what That's I mean. anathema to change yeah. Simeone, you're right. So, and Pep Guardiola might say, well, all black's not good enough for me with the body's feet. That's, yeah. So it's, it's difficult for anyone to be at the top of the pyramid and, and on every single person's eyes. And that's a good thing about football, not just goalkeepers, but everyone has a different opinion. But when, when we look at or my contention, I mean, I agree with everything that you've said, and I, or my contention would be that there's never been a time when there's such a wide range of absolute excellence. And maybe there's a simple answer, but I'm fishing for it. <laughs> Full-time one-on-one training every day rather than... Like, how I remember when Hodgson was coming through with, with Gorham at, at Rangers in Scotland, and one on one goalkeeper training was not necessarily the most common thing that yeah. existed, but he was regarded as you know a world guru like Stedman and knee surgeon, yeah, whatever. Mad, yeah. And now every single club will dedicate time yeah. to that, it's part of the central part of the work you do here at Derby. Yeah. You know, is, is one on one individual training every day the reason for it? Is it footballers saying, well, there's more to my job as a goalkeeper, therefore I have to expand my skills. Do you, do you have a feeling for why the level is so high? Um, Across the industry, I mean. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, I think that obviously helps. If you've got a coach to coaching you every single day, you know, I started my career at Glasgow Celtic and we had Joe Corrigan who came in on a Thursday. Ex-Manchester City. Yeah, ex-Manchester City goalkeeper came in on a Thursday and coached the keepers for one day a week. So if you take one day a week now till we're in here seven days a week, then naturally they're going to improve, get better. And also, I think the game's moved on and then the actual position of being a goalkeeper has moved on. You know, we used to get the ball and you'd be told to kick it down as far down the pitch as you can yeah. get it away from our goal type thing, you know. And if anybody looks to get the ball off you, push them up the pitch. You know, I used to get some horrendous back passes and I would see names and numbers going the other way. There'd be no one giving me any option to show for it. And now you, you see like the likes of most teams and even here at Derby, we, we encourage to play from the back. So when the keeper gets it, he has should have, you know, three, four, maybe five options where, where they play the ball. And I think that's good the way the game's moved on. When as the well. names and numbers are running away from you, mm. we don't need to name them. Mm. But because they were, because some footballers don't show. You know, no. I'm not having anything to do with that. Yeah. Or a coach says, never do that. Never pass it along the ball. You know, never take yeah, it. Yeah. What, what, what was it in that situation? The culture was still get it long players would hide from the responsibility on a bumpy pitch? What, what? Yeah, uh, probably the whole the whole coaching's moved on, not just the goalkeeping coach, but the whole game's moved on so much now that, you know, and, and, and in a sense, you know, people like Pep Guardiola and the likes have to take the credit for that because they've revolutionised the whole game of, of, of keeping possession. And, you know, we, we do studies here, you know, analysts here and stuff about, you know, at times we kick the ball long sometimes because we just, there's no options. If we're, the, the opposition have pressed really high, we can't get out, we've kicked the ball. And, and even maybe, we five minutes to go, we're leading the game, we think let's just kick it long, get up the pitch and, and squeeze it. But then we've put a we've put a stopwatch on the thing we and within nine, ten seconds the ball's back, back in our box. It's back. You know, and it's mad, but you think, well, if we had a thrown to the centre half and he had a play it there on number six and maybe back to the keeper and out the other side, it would be a lot longer if we can keep the ball. And it's just getting that mentality away from from But from when you grew up, you're a lot younger than me, but when you grew up, yeah. there's a huge change of mentality. Isn't oh, it? Massive. That whole, you because you put your finger on it, and it's it's really odd because Neil and I were talking about this recently as I was with a filmmaking partner, uh, Duncan, who made take the ball past the ball like that. It isn't that long ago hmm. that an advantage, an opportunity was to have the ball long. Yeah. I mean, I'm not talking about you know Jack Charlton. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not talking about Pomo, but I am talking about like when I began at Boston and see Frank Reichard, first of all, and, and Pep Guardiola reinstitute uh, Cruyff principles about if we have a free kick or a corner, put it down and take it to the, your nearest teammate. Mm. It isn't about how long can you put it or can you put the centre half under position. The majority of the times, we've got the ball, put it down, take it. Put it down, take it before the, the other team find it out. Yeah. If the other team is asleep. And at, at the start of it, you're like, well, why have you wasted a free kick? Yeah, that's right. Why have yeah. you wasted a minute? Well, you, you've not gained any. You're going back. 
but they still got the ball. Yeah. It's not long ago that we were all being, re- I can't speak for you, the broad football public was being totally re-educated by mm-hmm. that concept. And mm-hmm. now we all live and breathe it and yeah. we talk about playing out from the back. Yeah, even even now at Derby, that we're here this year, obviously, and, and Gary Rout was here last year and there's no, no slant on what he did, but he was quite direct last year, wouldn't play out from the back. And we've we've tried to change a lot. And at times we'd, I don't know, the centre half would come back to the goalkeeper and, and there'd be a few moans and groans around the crowd because thinking, why aren't we getting the ball forward? Yeah. But, you know, that's that comes from different managers, different styles of play and, and, and not educating the Derby fans because they don't know what they're doing. It's just because last year's style was, was, was the opposite of that. We're just trying to, you know, in, even the gaffer half sometimes after games is, has to inform them a little bit. That's how we want to play, try and keep possession. And inevitably, you'll, you know, you'll have more of the ball, you'll have more chances at the other end. And it's a change of culture, Shade. Yeah. In any walk of life, you can't change culture without people objecting or being uncomfortable with it and it is a not derby so it is a re-education i think mm. yeah re-education of certain players yeah definitely yeah. did you so when the ball was at your feet you know in any of your club situations were you comfortable playing it did mm-hmm. you i enjoyed playing it actually i much preferred playing but different different i i was sort of at the end of when it was kind of norm to play it i was kind of it was just coming into that when i was sort of coming out of and being honest and i would love to play now you know, I, I hated just kicking the ball on and, and, and what have you. And one, because McGroin's after games used to be hanging because you just had to kick it as far as you could and you'd be ice packs in your groins and your thighs, basically. And, and now it's just, because I was compi- quite composed when I played as well. I, I, once I crossed the white line, you know, it can be quite frantic at times, but once I crossed the white line, that was my sort of, I felt at ease with myself on the pitch and, and, and I could see things before they even happened. I could, I could just... You know, and I just feel that if I was playing now in the modern game, I, I would love it. Like, I would love, you know, the Ederson position to play and be a sweeper and stuff. I used to be a sweeper, keep people just saying, really quick off my line and stuff, but I'd be quick off my line just to clear up the pitch again. Mm. Whereas if if, they, if my defenders at the time would, would be, like, making angles and stuff, what a then I would, just, I would just be laying it off to them. It would be ah. so simple, you know, but that's the way the game's moved on. And, and I'm not saying, I, you know, it was it was terrible back then and it's brilliant now, but it's just different different times of, of, of the game. Um. Bet365 sent us another one. And again, I think it's reasonably simple um, for you, but not for us, because every footballer has dis- different criteria about what they do well. So if I asked you to name your greatest ever save, mm. not only what would it be, but why would you choose it? Hmm. Um, well, it's difficult. I'm not, I'm not a great person of saying I was brilliant at this and I was an amazing save. Or... This is off the record. Nobody's listening. No, no, yeah, just between you turn the mic off. And me. Yeah. Um, That's it. Because uh, I don't know. I mean, probably the one that stands out is, is New Sunderland v Newcastle. So I was at the Stadium of Light, and I made a save up to my left off Kevin Phillips, and it was, you know, obviously you can imagine the Derby games up there used to be phenomenal, and, and the atmosphere, and you know, we used to get bust in, and even the away fans get bust in. We sort of police escorts and stuff, and mm. you imagine the reception you get going into the stadium and, and all that stuff. And I loved all that. I was like, the bigger the game for me, the the better. I was like. Bring it on! Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. that's the sort of mentality I had. I was like, "Come on!" And, and and in that game, that's one of the saves. But I had about, I can't remember how many. I had a lot of big saves in that game. But that was the best save that I made in that game. And there was other great saves. But it made like technically a, reaction. No, it was pressure. a shot just from the edge of the box, and he whipped it. And I've just literally gone full length to my left, step and dive right up to the top. His right hand corner, my left hand corner, my left hand. I just got a finger to it, and it was one of them one saves you make, and you literally landed a yard outside the post or something, and it was like. I went thinking I've probably got no chance of saving it. And I, I say to the lads even now every day, you know, you can't save with your eyes. And that, that means, you know, you don't look at a good internet. You, you, you surprise yourself sometimes. You, 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 someone, a coach told me when I was 15, you can never save a shot with your eyes. You know, you see keepers and they stand and it hits the net. And Bobby Robson used to say that to me. He goes, son, I'm 72. I can stand and watch the ball go in the net. I want you to die for it. <laughs> and that stuck with me, all that, you know, all that stuff over the years. Like, but that was one of them saves. I've literally flew as far as, as, as humanly possible. And I got the end of my finger on my left hand to it. And I just got enough of the ball to go around the post. Do you golf? I do, yeah. Right, well, I'm not a particularly good golfer, so probably your shots are... Very, when so you hit not one, that often. When you hit one, you know yeah. how you don't feel it? Yeah, yeah. When you, when you click yeah, it, right, right, yeah. Yeah. When you're top corner, when you t- we always talk about fingertips. Yeah. Do you feel it? No, you don't feel nothing. You don't feel nothing. I mean, I remember, I think, rolling over and getting up, and I sort of give it a bit of a nod. I think it was Kevin Phillips, at the th- and I just give it a bit of a nod. Is that like, as if they say, is that the best you got? Like, with an arrogance and a, and a sort of like, right. And he, he at that stage, because he, he couldn't hit it any better, he was thinking, my God, we're not scoring today. It was one of them days that 
I think some coach said once you, you could have saved water today, you were just saving everything. You know, you could have caught water because it's just, it's just you get days like that as a goalkeeper. Of course you do. You get days you're you're on un, you're unbeatable and that save. And the reason I say that save is because I think it made the top ten saves of of Premier League history or something. And that that probably why it was in my head stuck out as well. But it was it was the derby. It was all it kept a clean sheet. It was it was a lot to it. You know, it was good. I have to I have to sort of begin to wrap up. Yeah. Simply because. International transport. You're a busy days. man, you're a busy man. Otherwise, you'd be paying that seat another <laughs> four or five hours and you think I'm joking. So I want to maybe wind up by giving you a, a choice. Either llamas, guys come in dieta, Tehran, or beating Barcelona at St James's. Llamas, I think, might have been a Christmas present at one stage for Big Duncan. <laughs> um, or, or bought by Big Duncan. Tehran must have been one of the most uh, sort of nerve-wracking moments of your life. Yeah. Guys come in here to a friend of mine and a guest in this series, one of the most upsetting moments of your sporting yeah, life. Possibly, yeah. Barcelona. Yeah. Thumping them. Yeah. Play out on this with the choice of anecdote or memory or feeling that uh, bring back. Well, some good ones there, some bad ones. Um, I probably have to say Tehran because. Growing up in Ireland, we mentioned Ireland and Donegal and Lifford, you know, growing up and, and, and sort of growing, growing up being a fan of being the Jack Charlton here and getting the World Cups and European Championships and stuff. And, and then to, to win a playoff in Iran, Tehran, it was just like once that final was won, because they scored in the 90th minute or something. And if they had got an Orwin, you know, was going to extra time and there was 100,000 male population in the stadium that night, it was carnage. The, you can imagine the atmosphere. There was all sorts going off. In the That's my point. What's that? What's that like? Flying there, arriving. Yeah. The country. I mean, as far and as strange possibly as you've seen in your career. Yeah. The worst I had was that we went in there a couple of days before, and Mick, Mick went to their time straight away. So like later, at different clubs have played in, in Europe and Champions League, and have you, and we stuck to the local time. No, well, we stuck to the English time. Sorry. So we went into I don't know, just for example, if Barcelona's an hour ahead or whatever. We actually stuck to UK time, but this was like a four or five hour swing. So Mick McCarthy went into their time straight away and a night before a game, I couldn't sleep. I was up at like four or five in the morning. I had to go and get the physio to get a, try and get a sleeping tablet. And we drew you to go for a walk that morning at 10. Mick's told the manager, well, Shay's not got to sleep till five o'clock or something. So sort of sacked the walk off or whatever and, and what have you. But I think just the whole importance of that game, because growing up as a fan and watching the Irish teams and then when they win the games in the World Cups, celebrating in the local town, Lifford, like hanging out of the cars with the flags and, and the scarves and the beatings of the horns and all. And, and then to be actually playing now as the best goalkeeper in Ireland and, and the final whistle gone off in Tehran to go, oh my God, now I'm going to the World Cup finals. As, as, the, as the man, I used to be diving around the garden like Packy Bonner, pretending I was Packy Bonner as a fan. And now, you know, there's probably kids in Ireland thinking they're Shea Given, which is even me sitting here now saying that sounds a bit surreal, but that's the realisation of it. And just that realisation when the final also went, we were actually going to Japan and Korea to, to play play for Ireland in the World Cup finals. That was there's no better feeling than were that. Were the people chanting boys in green behind the goal? Were there little pockets of fans? There was or? there was there was a pocket of fans, but it was literally I think it was I don't know, I can't remember exactly, but a hundred people or something. It was lost about in a hundred hundred thousand people, yeah. Iranians. Yeah, it was crazy. And they were in the stadium five hours before the game or something and we got off the bus and there's concrete and fruit and oranges and things and warming up before the game I mentioned. When you say that throne, are you talking about throne or, or what or what was concrete and fruit? No, like what? quite a bit of the stadium it was like an old fashioned stadium all made of concrete, so ah. they must have been pulling bits of the concrete off the seats and all and chucking at us and then I was warming up and there was these like sort of grenade things not a grenade, it was like when I hit the ground, it made this like it sounded like a grenade or whatever, going back to Port Mark, some by a gun, but <laughs> it was that loud. And I was stretching and it made you shake like that. And it was it was a good twenty yards away. I thought, oh, it's all right. And next one's gone away sort of two yards where you're sitting away from me. And it makes a hole in the ground and the dirt hit me in the face. And I'm like, ah, that's like a little bit too close for comfort because if I'd, if I'd have hit you, it would have done, would have done damage, like, you know, and it was... But I didn't know who they were screwing with. <laughs> you, you were like, like, because uh, you had a big one from Ali Dye that day. Yeah. People don't remember Ali Dye, yeah. I guess, but I know, scored yeah. a billion goals. Well, I had a big save, we talked about Kevin Phillips, I had, I had a massive save in Dublin on the first leg, actually, it was down to my left, the guys threw one on one, and it, it went full length again, down to my left, low, and I managed to keep it out, and had they scored an away goal, then... You know that that goal they did score in the ninth minute. They would have been going. You're, you're they right, would have been going. going and obviously, yeah, yeah. Ali Dali mentioned in the second leg had a couple of saves in the second leg as well. But you know, just as I say, the final whistle went off, and it was just like, oh my goodness, it was it was amazing. And then 
we had we weren't allowed any alcohol. We talk about having a few drinks after, and if you can't celebrate after getting their work final, you can never. And, and literally, we had bottles of water and changing because of the, the local rules and religions and all that and the laws they have. There's no alcohol out in the country, so we're spraying water as if it's champagne in the in the change room. And and then like we, we couldn't we flew out that night and literally we couldn't we couldn't open a, one beer until the wheels had left the had left the tarmac. And then you can imagine the party back to Dublin after that. I, I said it would be big, and just to pay them back for not allowing you to drink on their stalls, <laughs> but they were left not able to drown theirs. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. Do you know one of the things about this series? It's joy hearing other people talking about their joys. Yeah. It's really uplifting, and people who are listening are going to enjoy that a lot. And, I um, hope so. As far as llamas and, and Barca are concerned, it's going to have to be another day. No. <laughs> Actually, the, the, sorry, I'm going to be going to finish, but the, the Christmas present I got for one of the players was a heart. I don't want to mention his name, but he was... Can I? Well, he might not be happy. It's out there. I mean, so Alessandro Pistoni. Yeah. He, 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 uh, we had to get these Santa Claus things. and, and it He was, was overly gentle for an Italian defender. Well, yeah, if you had argue. any sort of... We always say play through the pain barrier as, a, as an Irishman or, or, or British Isles or whatever politically the right word is, but... If he felt anything, then he would. He would. He wouldn't play, or he had to be a hundred percent. Like, and I don't think I ever played a game a hundred percent. So, that's the know. thing I've encountered when I talk to footballers. The thing that they've got least tolerance for is somebody's like, "Oh, I've got a bit of yeah, pain no. here." Like, many other things can be forgiven yeah. and helped, but oh no, I think not today. You're on your own, lads. Yeah. It, crystal players don't get. Yeah, when well, my hands were freezing in that tractor all them years ago, my dad was saying, "There's nothing wrong. With you get on with." Then you, Alessandro, you, that's what you do. My kick <laughs> Beautiful. Shake it. All right. Thanks. Chris. A joy. Thanks, man. Thank you.